around 300 participants, uh, we can uh, start the program. Program even on the morning one. So informal chats are uh, so. Good morning to everyone. Uh, so on the dais as well as uh, the participants, uh, I welcome uh, uh, my past president, my uh, council colleague uh, Manoj Fadnilji. I welcome Dr. Anil Kumar, who is a co-organizer along with DD University. I welcome uh, Sanjay Bayani ji, Professor Sanjay Bayani ji, who will be chairing this session. I welcome Kapilishwar Bhalla ji, who is going to deal with the financial instrument. I also welcome my co-host uh, Avinash Gupta ji and uh, the promoter of the Voice of CA, Amar Mittal ji. He is not only a promoter, but he is a backbone of the Voice of CA. And also uh, my son C.A. Rishabh, who will uh, have the honor of uh, introducing the Honorable Past President. And uh, I also welcome Karthik Jindal, who is handling uh, last two days' queries uh, very fast. And also, uh, we have uh, around now 317 participants. Let me uh, tell you, sir, that uh, last two days, uh, we have a, a tremendous, uh, you can say, success in uh, hosting this program and a lot of participation are there. And the best part which we have done till yesterday, this is only for the purpose of uh, giving the information to my panelists and the uh, people, the class president sir and Kapilishwar Bhalla sir, that the board of the query was at nil, zero. Just like a cashier, when he closes the bank, if his cash is tallied, then he is the happiest person of the world. So we were the happiest person because our board was closed for all last two days. Now let me tell you, sir, few of the programs for the participants that we are going to announce in the month of the August. So every Friday on 7th, 14th, 21st, and 28th, we will have in the evening between 5 and 7, Dr. Giri Shauja dealing on various topics, which will be, which are there in my voice of CA, professional interest also and otherwise also. Besides this, we are having now two sessions on the service tax by CA Gaurav Gupta on 8th, between 12 and 2 on issues in annual return in GST for 18-19, its analysis and precautions. Then we will again have Gaurav Gupta ji on a very vibrant topic, disallowance and reversal of ITC, a 360-degree analysis. The program on 22nd will be between 4 and 6 p.m. The program on 8th will be in the morning. Please note the changes because yesterday night, one of my participants uh, mailed me around 10.30 that he could not note the time and as such he has missed. So please note the time and keep it tapped because Webex sends also the reminder one hour before the program. Then we have another uh, different, uh, you can say, program which is Rang De Basanti on 15th of August between 11 and 2. And we'll have a beautiful presentation along with Panya Vision and some of our members and the professionals. Then, sir, most likely on Sunday, we will have for the corporate people to give how to become a successful person in corporate. That we'll plan and we'll give you a notification on Sunday, coming Sunday on 9th of August. We are in the planning, we are finalizing with the faculty. So this is the background of uh, what we, uh, we are today. Now I would request uh, Dr. Anil Kumar to uh, begin the session with the, uh, giving the dice to uh, Professor uh, Sanjay Biani and other things. Dr. Anil Kumar. I would request my colleague Dr. Surinder Singh to formally introduce uh, the session chairperson, Professor Sanjay Bihani ji. Dr. Surinder Singh ji. 
dear panelists and participants to this uh, uh, certificate course on end AS. It gives me a great pleasure in introducing to you all our session chairman, Professor Sanjay Bayani. Professor Sanjay Bayani is the general secretary of the Indian Accounting Association and is serving as dean, professor, and head, Department of Business Management, MBA program at Saurashtra University, Rajkot. Gujarat. Professor Bayani did his BCom and MCom in accounting and management from Sardar Patel University. He was gold medalist in both these examinations. Thereafter, he completed his MPhil from the same university and PhD in, in finance from Saurashtra University, Gujarat. He uh, did FDMP uh, program for uh, IIM from IIM Ahmedabad and uh, was awarded the CRMS Fellowship. He has attended 50 international conferences and more than 70 national and state level conferences and published nearly 150 research papers in various national and international journals. He won number of awards, prizes, recognition in various national and international conferences, and many times won best research, research paper awards. He has completed three major research projects as principal investigator and one as co-investigator funded by UGC, AICT, ICSSR. He has rendered his services as an expert in various committees constituted by UGC, AICT, ICSSR. Uh, presently, is working as editor in chief for Journal of Commerce and Accounting and Management Trends. He has published many books, to name a few Practical Financial Statement Analysis, Cases in Financial Control, Accounting for Managerial Decision Making, Financial Analysis and Valuation, Corporate Dividend Policy. Basics of e-marketing, uh, doctoral research a way forward. 52 research scholars has completed uh, their MPhil degree under the supervision of Professor Bayani. And 27 research scholars has been awarded PhD degree under his guidance. Uh, friends, due to paucity of time, I have cut short many of his achievements and administrative assignments. But to sum up, he has been an outstanding student, an outstanding research scholar, and academician in the area of accounting and finance. As member of National Executive, Indian Accounting Association, I can say I have rather seen his contribution uh, in the field of uh, accounting and finance. It is a, a well-recognized contribution in our country. As General Secretary, he has been earlier as treasurer, has held many positions and he is very active in Indian Accounting Association. Friends, today we have the privileges to listen to his vast knowledge and expertise in the field of uh, accounting and finance. Once again, I welcome uh, Dr. Sanjay Bayani, sir, uh, to this webinar as chairperson. Over to Dr. Anil Kumar. Thank you, sir.
a close friend of mine for years now uh, to formally take over the session and give his initial remarks, then the session will proceed. Good morning to everybody. Uh, respected uh, past president of Institute of Chartered Accountant of India and today's uh, keynote speaker, CA Manoj Padnish. Another speaker of today's session, uh, CA Kapileswar Ballaji, and my best and very active friend and of Dr. Anil Kumarji, Dr. Surinder Singh Ji, uh, Amar Mittal Ji, CA Rishabh Ji, Karthik Jindal Ji, and all uh, Dr. Yes, uh, principal of DPUC, Dr. Hemchan Jain, uh, Dr. Monica Bansal, uh, Dr. C. Avinash Gupta and all other uh, fraternity those are associated with this program. First of all, being a sec general secretary of Indian Accounting Association, I would like to congratulate to Indian Accounting Association Delhi branch, specifically active person, uh, Anil Kumar ji, Surinder Singh ji, uh, M. Chand Jain ji, and their co-host of this certificate course uh, program, uh, Voice of CA. Uh, this is organized by Dean Dayal Upadhyay College, University of Delhi, and Indian Accounting Association Delhi chapter, Voice of CA. So first of all, I can say this is a three days event organized by all these organizations. And uh, this is in this pandemic situation, very good opportunity to the learners accountant, teachers, researchers, and students. And in the beginning the session, uh, host has uh, informed more than 320 participants has already joined. And I hope many more will join this program. In, in a present day in India, there are so many webinars organizing by different organizations. And uh, I can say this is a very unique program because presently we are giving so many theoretical aspects every day to the our students in the beginning of this session we discussed the new education policy so when i was the participant of one of the reputed uh, flagship program of mhrd leap at tata institute of social science this is a program of one two week program at indian university in one week program at foreign university. Second part is uh, that is in US, that is a University of uh, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania. So in that program, more discussion was that related to new education policy. And uh, in that aspect, presently we are providing the knowledge to the students. But the thing is, we have to provide the application of that knowledge that is more important rather than only knowledge. So I can say that this is a very good initiative to provide the applied knowledge in the field of Indian accounting standards in AS. And this, during this three days uh, program, uh, several practitioners. It means when we are, a, I am teacher, Anilji is teacher, but when we are only provide the basic knowledge of Indian accounting standards, okay, it is enough, but it is not highly very useful. So this is a very unique program. Like uh, I can say, okay, past presidents of ICI, they are providing their insight and knowledge to the this audience. So this is, uh, I can say, it's a very great honor for the listeners also, because not only theory we use. Suppose we have theory, but we don't have an application of that theory that will be never useful of that. So today's session, uh, coverage of this is in AS32 uh, that deals with the financial instruments presentation, and that is also related to International Accounting Standard 109 and related to this financial instruments, uh, another two standards are also there, that is uh, India uh, 109 and India 107. So I hope 
in today's session uh, participants will get inside knowledge about of the application of this standard so on behalf of this uh, organizer university of delhi and voice of ca i welcome all the participants i welcome all the guest speaker of this today today's uh, webinar and now i would like to request uh, anil ji to introduce the today's first speaker and hand over the mic to him for benefits of this thank you sanjay ji uh, i would request uh, sanjay agarwal ji to uh, go forward for the rest of the time thank you sir before i ask uh, sir rishab my son to formally unveil uh, my past president uh, manoj fadnis ji i would like to say few words that he is excellent human and i remember still one my foreign visit along with him to china because i am a fully vegetarian person now what had happened in china able to get anything vegetarian so we traveled 15 km for searching the vegetarian food and for the whole of the 3 year so he is very fond of non vegetarian he has not taken any non vegetarian uh, food in along with me and also not only that night dinner he uh, matlab uh, took that privilege to host that dinner but whole of four days when we were there he made sure that i should get everything vegetarian along with him now with this i request c a rishab agarwal to formally introduce my past president manoj fadnis ji welcome fadnis sir we are glad to have you on our session and it's a pleasure to learn from you i i know you don't require any introduction i'll just give a very short introduction about what your achievements and what you are currently doing so uh, manoj fadnis sir has passed his uh, graduation from indore university and he is a chartered accountant with more than 33 years of experience and uh, he was everyone knows that he was the past president of icai in the term 2015 and 16 and currently he is the president of confederation of asian and pacific accountants moreover he is the independent director of uh, the federal bank and many more listed and unlisted uh, companies and uh, he specializes in corporate accounting and reporting standards direct taxes corporate law and fema so it's a pleasure to have you on our session and learn from you uh, over to you sir we can begin with the session now thank you very much uh, rishab ji for that uh, introduction and thank you sanjay bhai for remembering our visit to beijing in the year 2013 so seven years have gone by but the memories are uh, still vivid and alive Uh, it is a great pleasure to join this program being organized uh, with the help of voice of ca uh, for this uh, session a very distinguished chairman of the session professor and uh, dean and head uh, department of business management saurashtra university rajkot uh, shri sanjay bhayani ji uh, it is a pleasure to have this session being chaired by you as you are the general secretary of indian accounting society uh, you bring along with your other colleagues uh, rich academic uh, knowledge uh, to this technical uh, session and i am sure all participants will greatly benefit from your uh, very intelligent and academic deliberations uh, dr anil kumar ji uh, dr surendra singh ji uh as uh, my friend sanjay bhai said the backbone of voice of ca and a very distinguished senior member a uh, person i know for a very long period of time ca si amit ji uh ca si abhinash gupta ji my distinguished co speaker ca si kapileshwar bhalla ji who is taking up a very challenging subject on financial instruments ca uh, si kartik jindal ji Uh, and of course a very young dynamic uh, ca rishab agrawal thank you very much for uh, this honor and privilege to be here rishab i am now uh, also a past president of confederation of asia and pacific accountants fortunately i let down my position in november 2019 just before this outbreak of covid 19 so uh, 
Asia and Pacific was the reason where I was traveling a lot, and that is the reason which is now greatly infected with this COVID-19. Uh, uh, it is uh, also good to see that how technology is being uh, used by organizers to ensure that people sitting in Rajkot, Indore, Delhi, and all across the country are interacting with each other in a seamless manner and enjoying the benefit not only of knowledge, but also the application of knowledge as so rightly brought out by the, by the chairman. I must also, uh, before I start on my presentation, also acknowledge the great contribution of my friend Sanjay Agrawalji to the cause of the Chartered Accountancy profession. Your dedicated uh, devotion for more than two decades, which I have seen your deep knowledge on taxation and allied laws, but you have a very humane and a very personal touch when you sit as a judge on the disciplinary committees, you have been doing justice. So wherever a member was uh, to be punished, you never spared that member, but whenever a justice was required to be done, you were fearless in giving a proper uh, justice to all such members. So it is a great pleasure, Sanjay Bhai, to uh, join this webinar. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, friends, I have been asked to speak on certain issues in the first time adoptions of India's Indian accounting standards, which are converged with the international financial reporting standards. I understand for last two days, there has been a rich deliberations on some of the aspects of uh, India's, and I would also be touching upon the certain aspects with respect to the first time adoption. Friends, uh, the first time adoption, which is covered by the standard on India's 101, which is the first time adoption of India's. And this is a standard which lays down the various policies, procedures, principles, which are to be borne in mind as we transit from accounting standards to India's. So there are bound to be certain difficulties, some challenges, but these are the principles which are codified in India's 101, which we need to keep in mind. And we would discuss the practical aspects as was mentioned by our very distinguished academic colleagues who are in this session that even the new education policy is tuned at ensuring application of knowledge and not just the contents of knowledge. So let us look at India's from the practical aspect, keeping the academic and the uh, technical contents in mind. So when we prepare the financial statements as per India's, and now India's have been notified, as you know, under uh, Section 133 of the Companies Act, as Companies Indian Accounting Standard Rules 2015. So the year in which we adopt this India's, it cannot come with subject to qualifications and uh, adverse comments, disclaimers, that is not permitted. What is said is that when you adopt India's financial statements, you must adopt them completely to the extent applicable to your company or your client. To the extent applicable, you must adopt all the uh, applicable standards and the principles contained in the standard. You cannot make a pick and choose type of a situation that this I will apply, this I will defer. That is not permitted. So what is required in the standard is a explicit and an unreserved statement. You need to make an explicit and unreserved statement that yes, my financial statement has been prepared in accordance with applicable India's. So this is uh, very important as we migrate from A's to India's. We cannot say that a person is healthy, but subject to his liver not being well, or he has a diabetes and he has this problem, but on the whole, he is healthy. So such qualified statements are not accept acceptable under India's, and it has to be an explicit and an unreserved statement by the management, confirmed by the auditors, that all applicable Indian accounting standards have been complied with. Now, when we transition, from AS to AS, there is this concept of an opening balance sheet. Opening balance sheet is assuming we are transiting in the financial year 2019-20, the year which has just closed. This is the year in which the company has transited. So the previous year 
is the corresponding previous year is 2018-19. 19-20 is the year in which we are transiting, but the preceding year, 18-19 is the comparative year, and the first date of that comparative year is the 1st April 2018. So the opening balance sheet is required to be prepared as on 1st of April 2018. So we have financial statements for 1920, comparatives for 1819, and an opening balance sheet as of 1st of April 2018. So that all those transitions from accounting standards to India's come in that opening balance sheet once and for all, and then after that, it is purely on India's basis. So this is one of the features of India's. Now, why this is important is because under India's, when we are presenting financial statements, say for 2019-20 with comparatives for 18-19, it is essential that all your accounting policies for these two years should be uniform. Now, say for instance, we have an accounting policy on valuation of inventories. Now, valuation of inventories, supposing I'm valuing the inventory on first in, first out basis. But now, because of some changes in business or trade or the nature of my transactions, I find that instead of first in, first out, I must go on a weighted average method. That is also an acceptable policy for inventory valuation. But I cannot just change my method of valuation for 2019-20. India requires that whatever accounting policy I follow for 2019-20 should be the same accounting policy which I should follow even for 2018-19. And therefore, my valuation of inventory as on 31st of March 2020, which is my closing inventory for this year, 1st of April 2020, 19, which is the opening inventory for this year, and which also becomes the closing inventory for the preceding year, 31st of March 2019. And since I'm also giving the financial statements for 1819, my opening inventory as on 1st of April 2018 should also be on weighted average method. So right from 1st of April 2018 to 31st of March 2020, I'm required to use the same accounting policies and prepare my financial statements and disclose it. This is different from what we have in our existing accounting standards. So in the existing accounting standards, what happens is we say, if you change the accounting policy, you disclose the quantum of the change. So 18, 19, I have prepared on first in, first out. 19, 20, I will prepare on weighted average method. I am required to disclose only the quantum when I prepare as per our account existing accounting standards, AS5. So I may give an impact that because of the change in the inventory, my profits for this year are higher or lower by this particular amount. But what happens is the reader of the financial statement, when he is making his analysis, how much is the inventory turnover ratios? What is the percentage of raw material consumption to sales? He will get different ratios for 18-19 and different ratios for 19-20 because the basis of the accounting policy is different. So the underlying principle is the accounting standards are meant for the investors. These are for the general purpose financial statements. These are for the purposes of financial statements on the basis of which shareholders, creditors, others who have no connectivity with the management directly and can get information directly from the management. They rely on these financial statements to take decisions regarding their involvement with that particular company. So that shareholder, that investor, that reader of the financial statements should be given financial statements with uniform accounting policies. So if he is calculating material consumption to sales or he is calculating inventory turnover ratios, he must have the same basis of inventory before him and we should not ask him to make changes here and there and then in that process make some mistakes and arrive at different conclusions and different decisions. So 
Many of these international financial reporting standards on which our indias are based are complex. They require a lot of subjective decision. They involve a lot of time in understanding them and applying them. But the underlying principle is these principles are not meant to give comfort to the preparers and auditors of these financial statements. These principles in these standards are meant to give more transparency, more information, more awareness and knowledge to the readers of the financial statements. And therefore, the accounting policies, this is one of the fundamental principles in India's that the accounting policies under India's have to be uniform for the entire period of two years, starting from the first date of the preceding year to the last date of the current year. So, 1st of March, 1st of April 2018 to 31st of March 2020, there should be uniform set of accounting policies. Now, friends, when we transit from India's to AS, we have been following different principles. And as you know, uh, there are so many variations between accounting standards and India's. India's are said to be more giving more emphasis on the economic substance of the transaction. Even in accounting standard one, we say that we will give importance to uh, substance over the legal form. But as we know, in many cases, what happens is we uh, still land up giving more importance to the legal form. One of the examples which I can say about this is when we have uh, separate shares. Now, preference shares under the Companies Act are part of the share capital. So, we classify preference share capital as part of the equity share capital along with the equity share capital. But the economic substance of preference share is different. Equity share capital will be returned to the shareholder only at the time of winding up of the company. As against this, and our friend Mr. Robo, Bhalla, who is going to discuss this aspect in more detail, will be sharing his knowledge as to what circumstances preference shares is not akin to equity instruments. So what happens is that equity shareholders are given their money only at the time of dissolution of the company, winding up of the company, and they get the net assets. That is the difference of assets less liabilities. But preference shares can be structured in different ways. So today I want to borrow loan from my friend Sanjay Bhai and I tell him Sanjay ji you give a loan to my company but if I take a loan from you it is going to affect my debt equity ratios. So you don't show, we will not show it as a loan, we will show it as a preference. If you want rate of interest to be say 7% or 8% we will say it is instead of interest we will say it is a dividend of preference shares. And yeah, this loan is for a period of five years. So I will say the preference shares are issued for a period of five years. Same transaction, a loan borrowed, rate of interest being paid, loan being repaid after a particular time period, but instead of calling it loan, we call it as preference share capital. So that is what is in under India's is not permitted. So India's would require such a transaction to be recognized as a debt and uh, classified as a debt. Dividend paid on such a uh, preference shares will be classified as a finance cost and all consequences would apply. So when we transit from, India, from AS to India, as I said, our opening balance sheet is 1st of April 2018. Considering the financial year 1920 as the year, Corresponding previous year is 1819, and the opening balance sheet is as of 1st of April 2018. So, the balance sheet as on 31st of March 2018, which has been prepared as per accounting standards, will have to undergo a lot of surgical treatment. So, a lot of adjustments will have to be made to that 31st of March 2018 balance sheet to convert it into the opening balance sheet as on 1st of April 2018, which becomes our starting point. Now friends, we have huge 
very rich educational material. I would like to share with our honorable chairman, uh, Professor uh, Bhayaniji and our other very distinguished academicians who are present with this. Sir, our Institute of Chartered Accountants website is loaded with very, very rich technical material which is freely downloadable. There is a lot of education material which will explain each standard clause by clause with examples, with frequently asked questions, with, with illustrations. Our, uh, one of the very fine reading materials today on India's friends, many people ask me, what should I read in India's? I tell them, go and read final CA study material, which is there on our institute's website. Very good, high quality education material. Similarly, this on India's 101, there is very fine examples given in those education material which I have uh, captured on this slide. As to what are the types of adjustments which are required when we transit from accounting standards to India's. And these are just what are the kinds of issues which come in. So if you look at the hallmarks between uh, hallmarks of India's which distinguish India's from AS. One example I said is substance over form, and I give the example of preference shares. Second, friends, is time value of money. If I take 100 rupees from you today, and I say I will return it to you after one year, and I will not pay you interest. So 100 rupees today has a value of 100 rupees. 100 rupees, if it, if it is not paying any interest, and if you're getting it after one year, its value is not 100. As, all, as students of accountancy and commerce, we know that money has a time value. So time value of money is one of the important criteria which is recognized under India's. So if I make a provision for a payment, and this is more so in case of service compensation arrangements, we have large construction activities going on across the country. It is in public-private partnerships. Our very extraordinarily built Indira Gandhi International uh, Airport is also under uh, public-private partnerships. Now, those assets which are created by the uh, service concessioner, how they should be accounted for, there is less guidance in AS as compared to what is under India's. And if a amount is to be paid, not today but after five years, then we need to discount that provision under India's. So these are examples of adjustments which are required to be made to that balance sheet as of 31st of March 2018, so that it becomes the opening balance sheet, the starting point for our journey under India's. When we are preparing the balance sheet, opening balance sheet as of 1st April 2018, we need to take into account all those facts and circumstances which were available to you on that date. So as I said, discounting is one of the important features under India's. So what is the discount rate? And as all of us know, when we calculate the present value, if the rate of discount changes from 10% to 9% or 11%, the present values will change significantly. So generally what is taken is, what is the rate at which the bank, your bank is giving loan to you? Now, the, your bank rate could be different on 1st of April 18, 31st of March 19, and 31st of March 2020. So if you are discounting a provision for your opening balance sheet as on 1st of April 2018, you need to consider what was your borrowing rate on that date. So estimates are not to be revised because of hindsight knowledge. So the standard says, go back to that date, See what is the information available at that point of time and decide your estimates. Then friends, for the smooth transition from India, from AS to India's, we have certain retrospective uh, applications given in Appendix B, certain exemptions which are given in Appendix C, and certain optional exemptions which are given in the way these exemptions have been structured under option D, appendix D, is such that right accounting principles 
as prescribed under Companies Accounting Standards Rules 2006, notified by our Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, that company should have the minimum difficulties in transiting from AS to India. So the manner in which the assets are calculated, the manner in which the depreciation is provided, and you have a written down value of that asset on 31st of March 2018, then that can be considered as an opening balance in the opening balance sheet. So the difference arises is because earlier, as you know, we had Schedule 14 to the Companies Act 1956. Our friends like Rishabh, uh, for them, this is something uh, too long back in the history. But for all of uh, many of us uh, present, we know that we had Companies Act 1956. We had Schedule 6 to the Companies Act up to 2011 when it was revised. And after 2013, uh, Act became applicable from 1st of April 2014. We now have a Schedule 3 to the uh, Companies Act and Schedule 2. Earlier, what we had was Schedule 14 to the Companies Act 1956 which gave certain depreciation rates. They were not necessarily linked up to the useful life of those assets. But now under the new law, the law has been aligned with our accounting standards and the assets are required to be depreciated based on their useful life. So if the depreciation charged in the earlier period, as per the law prevailing at that point of time, was in accordance with the law and standards as applicable under AS, then that written down value can also be considered as part of the deemed cost when we transit from AS to India. So all these practical difficulties have been well considered by our institute and the government in, carrying, in preparing these optional exemptions which are given in Appendix D when we transit from AS to India. So friends, the journey is very interesting, very exciting. Uh, there are a lot of changes which will come in. There will be some difficulties, but uh, these exemptions, as I said, for uh, fixed assets, which is under uh, Para D 7 AA of Appendix D, would uh, enable a company to just accept whatever is the opening balances was on 1st of April 18 in their gross block to be carried forward. Otherwise, a company which is say 10 years old or 30 years old or maybe 100 years old will have to dig into its balance sheets of last 30, 40 years and find out how the assets were capitalized, how the assets were depreciated, what is component accounting. So if you wish to do that, you can do it. But if you find that the time and cost is more, then the benefits that you get, you can simply pick up these exemptions which are given in Appendix D and move forward. So, friends, uh, we have these uh, three balance sheets in the first time adoptions, 1st of April, 31st of March 19 and 31st of March 20. We prepared two statements of profit and loss, two statements of cash flows, two statements of changes in equity, and one set of notes of accounts which give all this information. Then 31st of March 18, we have, recon we have prepared under AS. We are now preparing under India's. Similarly, 18, 19, we had prepared under AS. Now it is being restated under India's. So a reconciliation is required to be given to explain what are the major changes, why your profit has changed, why your net worth has changed. Earlier, you are recognizing, say, preference shares as part of the equity. Now you are treating it as a hybrid instrument and taking it partly under equity and partly under debt. So all those items of reconciliation are required to be explained, to be given through. So I just prepared this table to summarize how the India's uh, transition has taken place. The first phase started in the year 2016-17, comparatives were 2015-16. And for these companies, the date of transition was 1st of April 2015. And similarly, going forward from 17, 18, 19 to say 19, 20, 18, 19 was the comparative year. 1st of April 2018 would be the date of transition. And for those companies which are to transit in the current financial year 2020, 21, then the comparatives will be 19, 20, and date of transition will be 1st of April 2019. So. Uh, 
there are various uh, retrospective applications given in Appendix B, C, and D. Uh, I would not take your time through all this uh, because this would uh, require a full session by itself. Uh, I think we'll devote some time before I close off on some of the questions which members may like to ask. Uh, this is uh, the one which I was mentioning on deemed cost. This has been a very, very popular exemption amongst all the companies in India where you could carry forward your written down cost of property, plant and equipment on the date of transition to a, uh, from India's to AS without spending too much of time. When this exemption was brought in, many people across the world said you are creating unnecessary differences, you are converging, you are not adopting. But if you look at the reality in India, by and large, even all big industries, large listed companies which are dominating the Sensex on the BSE and NSE, they have been using this exemption under deemed cost. We started as a convergence process, that is our starting points were different, but our objective is that the end point should be the same. We have a very strong and vibrant accounting standards board, friends. We should write to them, bring out our differences, bring out the challenges or bring out the issues that we come across with the help of such distinguished academicians who, if some of them can engage themselves into creating a research paper, which could be very helpful to the Institute and the Accounting Standards Board, and we can play an important role in the global scenario as a thought leader. You will be happy to know, friends, that insofar as IAS 41 is concerned, which is on biological assets, but which is titled as agriculture, our institute has been, uh, has been uh, a major player in changing the international standard to what we believed in India was the right accounting. So uh, we cannot say we are right all the times, but we should be open for corrections. And if we believe very sincerely that some of our accounting principles are more robust, then we should engage in an intellectual discussion with the international bodies and as we successfully so uh, thank you if, uh, without proceeding further my presentation would be with the organizers and they can be shared with the uh, with the members who have joined in if there are any questions which members would like to ask I would be happy to take those questions now uh, uh, thank you Fadni, sir uh, in the board, uh, uh, anybody, if you have a question, you can post it or you can raise your hand as uh, past presidents are wanted to uh, leave for some time, so he will be available for question answer in the later session also. Uh, one question, uh, it is uh, Mr. Shah, sir, can you please explain para D7AA with any example regarding yeah. functional currency? Okay, okay. Question, uh, first is, for the benefit of all of us, what we mean by functional currency. So, if I am an Indian company and I am preparing my financial statements, let us say, uh, I am preparing my financial statements which are ultimately required to be presented in terms of rupees. So, my rupee becomes my presentation currency. It need not be my functional currency. The difference is that if I'm an Indian company and my entire operations are, let us say, in United States, so I'm raising my funds in US, my billing is in US, I have a limited operations in India where I'm incurring, say, my employee cost and uh, some other cost, but my entire business in U is in US. Now, if I do some transaction in Europe, the functional currency enables me to recognize my US dollars as my functional currency and not Indian rupees. And therefore, when I do a transaction in Europe in euros, I will convert those euros into dollars and not euros into rupees. All my transactions will get translated in terms of dollars because I recognize that as my functional currency in which my business is happening. 
and later on the year, all my assets liabilities and financial performance i will convert them into from dollars to indian rupees and the foreign exchange difference i will not charge it off to the profit and loss statement i'll take it as part of the other comprehensive income in my statement of changes in ept that is how this concept of functional currency arises if functional currency is not to be recognized then even all my transactions in dollars and those transactions i'll have to uh, convert them into indian rupees so I, whenever i raise an invoice in dollars i'll have to recognize that in the indian rupee on that date my data i will uh, recognize the payment uh, in indian rupees on that date and the difference between the sale price and the amount collected will go as a foreign exchange differences to my pnl whereas when i recognize the functional currency the functional currency enables me to recognize my transactions in that currency in which my entire business is happening and finally convert that into my indian rupees as my presentation currency now moving forward with respect to d7aa what happens is that i have certain assets in my balance sheet uh, d7aa is with respect to property plant and equipment and as i explained earlier there are companies with say 10 years history 30 years history 100 years history now they may may not have assets which are of more than say 20 30 40 years but if there are buildings buildings generally have a useful life of 60 70 years so a company in 2020 which has acquired a building in 1960 will have to see whether the capitalization to that cost of the building was properly done whether the depreciation has been charged properly or not so this would incur a lot of cost time and energy so there are certain exemptions which are given in ifrs 1 which says that instead of doing all that you can take the fair value of that asset on the date of transition so that exemption is also available in addition to that an indian company because it has been following the accounting standards it has been following the companies act it is following schedule 14 to the companies act it has its assets properly recognized depreciation properly charged so whatever is the return down value of the assets on 31st of march 2018 which we are saying 1st of april as date of transition you take those numbers as the opening parenthesis and you move forward so this is one very beneficial exemption given in indias which leads to convert to a carve out from ifrs 1 but if you look at even the large indian companies which are which dominate as i said, said the uh, stock exchange sensex is they have been applying this benefit so it just goes to prove that how useful it is and how it relevant it is in the indian context sir and what you in ds1 prohibits extraordinary item what is the rationale where are these items shown so uh, very good question himanshu ji uh, our accounting standard 5 says extraordinary and ordinary then as a example of extraordinary item it says that if there is an earthquake that becomes an extraordinary event and therefore you disclose extraordinary uh, losses or gains which are extraordinary in nature separately now over a period of time what has uh, the the way business has developed and we must always appreciate that accounting standards are the grammar of the business so as the the uh, business develops as the complexities in business develop technologies develop the grammar also has to move uh, and keep pace with those changing transactions so what has happened is today what we talk about is exceptional items we don't say extraordinary or ordinary so the context under indias is nothing is extraordinary today there will be a tsunami there will be an earthquake there will be a pandemic there will be a lockdown there will be a war there will be floods these are things which will happen from time to time when you say you are a going concern you expect your entity to be in uh, going on in future there will be fire there will be some or other calamity which will take place so these are at the most something could be an exceptional item but nothing is extraordinary and therefore 
whatever is an ordinary item which is of an unusual nature, unusual size. Friends, even accounting standard 5 requires an ordinary item but of a different size and proportion to be separately disclosed. If you see para 12 and para 14 of AS5, it gives you those examples of ordinary items which require a separate disclosure. AS12 gives you certain examples of extraordinary items. But now under India's, we have nothing which is extraordinary. It could be exceptional, so it will require a separate disclosure. Sir, uh, I'm sorry, one of my friends has mentioned that voice is not clearly audible. Uh, I'll try and speak more clearly for the next questions. Uh, Asa Tandanji, sir, can you please give a practical example of deemed cost? Yes, Sanjay, can you please repeat uh, for deemed sir, cost? What is it? Sir, there? can you please give a practical example of deemed cost? Okay, so as I said, suppose I have purchased the planted machinery in 2010 and I have capitalized certain expenses which are permissible as per accounting standard then prevailing. And I have depreciated it up to 31st of March 2018 using the principles of AS10. Up to 31st of March 2014, we had companies Schedule 14, Companies Act 1956, Schedule 14, and thereafter we have this Schedule 2 to the Companies Act, which talks about useful life. So I have made all these adjustments and I have arrived at what is the uh, return on value as on 31st of March 2018. Now, when I transit to India, what is required is whether the capitalization was as per India 16. Now, India 16 has certain more requirements as compared to AS 10. Now, the AS 10 has also been revised and AS 10 has been made parametric as India 16. But AS 10, India 16 has one requirement which is, say, of component accounting, which was not so well recognized in our old AS 10. So, what is the component accounting? That if you purchase a machine of, say, one crore machine has a one component, say 10 lakhs rupees. Now the machine has a useful life of 10 years. But this component of 10 lakhs of rupees has a useful life of only four years. So what India 16 will say that you depreciate 90 lakhs 10 years, and this component of 10 lakhs of rupees, you depreciate it for four years. So when you transit from AS to India's, there are two or three different options. One is you do a full India's adjustments as required to all your assets and say that I will find it out as per India 16 and then uh, take that as a deemed cost on the date of transition. So this is one option. Second option which is there under IFRS and also in India's is you take the fair value. If you if you are if you are just four or five years old company, you can find out all these numbers and do the backward calculations under India 16 and arrive at the numbers. But if you are a 30 year old company, you were formed say in 1990, then it will be very difficult for you to do all those calculations, get all that data for last 30 years. So IFRS 1 and India 101 also gives you an uh, option that instead of doing this for 30 years, you may take the fair value of this asset on the date of transition. So, and that becomes the deemed cost going forward. Third option, which is in days, is that you take the 31st of March 18 and take it as a deemed cost. So friends, deemed cost is the cost which is recognized under in days as on the date of transition. So these are only one-time exemptions which are given when we transit from AS to India. Sir, next question, Satyam Singh Ji. He is talking about the uh, exceptions which you have taught. 
exemptions uh, would these exemption be applied retrospectively or prospectively so uh, friends uh, you i mentioned there are three appendices which we need to see appendix b appendix c and appendix d and each exemption will have to be looked at in relation to that particular exemption so there are we have to select stock option plans so employee stock option plans if the company has issued an uh, has issued a, a option plan and it has made it public if it was a listed company it would have followed the sab guidelines and would have made it would have made adequate disclosures if it is a unlisted company at that point of time it may not have made its uh, public disclosures so each exemption has to be looked at in context in which it is stated some of them could have retrospective applications many of them would have prospective applications sir i think you wanted to leave uh, uh, any last one or two questions which you think are important i think board is members. clear they are not related directly to the your topic we'll take it take okay. it for bala sir uh, session and uh, Sir, uh, I am thankful to you that you have devoted this much time, and at the same time, I have to say sorry to the Babi ji and the family member that we have no, no, no. Uh, take, taken uh, time on the Sunday from their family time. And uh, once again, thankful to you, and we'll keep on continuing the various. Uh, this is a beginner one. We'll have another uh, certificates, more certificates. advance offer so with this uh, uh, now i would request uh, kartik jindal ji to kindly introduce the kapileshwar bhalla sir thank you sir for providing me that opportunity to introduce ye kapileshwar bhalla sir kapileshwar bhalla sir is a chartered accountant having experience of more than 20 years he is a first class he is a first class from shri ram college of commerce ऑनर्ड Uh, for providing me this wonderful opportunity uh, to interact with the, the members at large and i think uh, it's a privilege to share the dais with uh, the past president and uh, learned distinguished uh, speakers i think professors from uh, various universities so i think uh, it's really a privilege and i think i have, uh, have a very interesting topic to speak on and uh, i think uh, one thing which uh, manoj sir has already made a stress that indices is all based on the economic substance of the transaction and i think this goes very true in terms of a topic like financial instruments mm. uh now before i deal with this particular topic on financial instruments i like to give a little brief background before you know we start off with this particular issue i guess uh, on day 1 uh mp vijay kumar sir has already you know dealt with the issue of presentation of financial statements where i think uh, everybody would have seen how the schedule 3 balance sheet is presented and if if i were to compare the transition from a division 1 balance sheet to a division 2 balance sheet one of the major changes one would look into is that the balance sheet which was there under division 1 was segregating the assets as well as the liability in terms of current and non current i mean one could not see any further segregation in terms of you know the current and non current assets being further segregated but one can see a very clear distinction in terms of division 2 that when you look at the balance sheet on the assets and on the liability side you would see that the assets which are segregated in terms of current and non current are further segregated in terms of financial and non financial similarly you would see on the liability side of the balance sheet the liabilities have also been segregated in terms of financial and non financial liability so one of the core uh, 
I would say the presentations in the balance sheet is relating to the fact that the assets and the liabilities are segregated in terms of financial, non-financial, and then there is a further segregation in terms of financial and non-financial. So we are segregating current, non-current, and then a further segregation in terms of financial and non-financial. Now, the first thing which comes to the mind is, you know, when you look at an asset or you look at a liability and you're making a distinction whether it's current or non-current in nature, it is all the guidance given in Indus 1. And we're also given the guidance in terms of the Schedule 3, where an explanation is given, when do you say that, you know, an asset or liability is current or non-current? And if you look at the para number 66 and the para number 69 of Indus 1, it exposes us in detail that, you know, whether the item is current or non-current in nature. But as I said, in order to make the balance sheet of the company, and you would be wondering, you know, why I'm putting a stress again on the balance sheet front, why I'm not talking of the income statement, which I'll throw a light very soon. But if you look at the distinction in terms of financial and non-financial, that needs an insight on the subject called financial instruments. Now, you can imagine the complexities involved in a standard like financial instruments that since it is dealt with in a total of three standards, you know, there is Indus 32, which talks of financial instruments presentation. Then there is Indus 109, which talks about financial instruments recognition and measurement. And then there is also Indus 107, which deals with financial instrument disclosure. So one can well imagine, you know, when there are a total of three standards which are there, then you can well imagine, you know, that what is the complexity involved in a subject like financial instruments. Well, I don't say that, you know, with today's input, we are going to become experts on that area. I have chosen to speak uh, on Indus 32 today because each and every standard has got a plethora of details. So I'm going to concentrate on Indus 32 today. And I've also tried to make it as simple as understandable. So I think uh, the participants would have any questions in between you can definitely stop me, but I hope uh, we'll restrict the questions during this course uh, to the topic of discussion. If you've got any further questions, then I think we can definitely handle them later. Now, let me start with, first of all, the concept of financial instruments. Now, I am going to use both a PPT as well as I'm going to use the text of the standard as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to first of all, take you to the Indus 32 text. And I'm going to play a small little game before we actually start with the standard because I want to keep it interactive. And at the same time, you know, the learning aspect also takes place. So I'm going to first uh, share the standard with you. So I am coming to first of all Indus 32 and there is a definition which is given in the para number 11. So I'm reading the definition in para number 11. And if you read the definition, it says a financial instrument is any contract. Now I'm not reading further. I'm just looking at that financial instrument is any contract. Now we all know that, you know, when we look at a contract, there are always a minimum of two parties in any contract. So when you look at that, there are two parties in a contract, the question what comes to the mind is, which two parties am I looking at in terms of a financial instrument? Now I would say that one party is which prepares the asset side of the balance sheet. And there is another party which prepares the liability side of the balance sheet. I think let's give them names also, which are, of course, the technically correct names. The party which makes the asset side of the balance sheet is called the holder. That is called the holder of the instrument. And the entity which is going to make the liability side of the balance sheet is called the issuer of the instrument. 
So when we're looking at a financial instrument, so we would say one is the entity which is the issuer of the instrument, which is going to make the liability side of the balance sheet. And the other is the holder of that instrument who is going to show it on the asset side. Now, before I take it further, you know, there is one very pertinent question which is coming to my mind. If I just try to link it to the Schedule 3 balance sheet, we all know that as far as the liability side of the balance sheet is concerned, the heading is equity and liability. So does this mean that when an issuer is presenting a balance sheet on the liability side, he needs to take a decision that is this instrument an equity or is this instrument a liability? Which means in simple words, equity would connote that it is an own fund. And when you say it's a liability, it is supposed to be a loan funds. That means whenever an entity would issue an instrument, it needs to take a decision regarding the presentation. Mind you, there are two, three aspects in terms of accounting. One is that the instrument is to be presented as an equity or is it to be presented as a liability? So Indus 32 talks about the presentation. The next is that what is the value at which the instrument is going to be measured initially as well as at a subsequent stage. Now that issue is dealt under index 109, which talks about the financial instruments recognition and the presentation. And then comes the aspect of disclosures and that is dealt under index 107. So, Every standard is dealing with a separate subject in terms of financial instruments. So we can now say that when I look at the term that financial instrument is any contract, so I said that the contract is between two parties. One is what we said is the issuer, and one is what we said is the holder. The holder is the one who's going to make the asset side of the balance sheet and the issuer is the one who is going to make the liability side. I think now we can read it further. It says a financial instrument is any contract that gives rise to a financial asset for one entity. Now, if I were to define which is that entity that is supposed to be the holder and a financial liability or equity instrument for another entity. And which is that another entity? It is supposed to be the issuer. Now, I guess, the two parties, and the decision is to be taken, you can say, by the issuer. Well, don't take me incorrect. Let me first of all clarify. As far as Indus 32 is concerned, it is basically deals with an issuer. I am not saying that it is not meant for the holder. But you know, the, if you look at the definition also, the major decision to be taken is whether the instrument is an equity or whether the instrument is a liability, that decision is to be taken for the issuer. Now, whether it's an equity instrument, the holder would always say it's a financial asset. Now, even if you say that it is supposed to be an equity instrument, the holder would always say that it is a financial asset. So, Indus 32 is giving us a guidance in terms of taking a decision when do you say the instrument is equity or when do you say it's a financial liability? Now, with this inputs in hand, I think I've zeroed down on the fact that what is the sole objective of my discussion right now to take a decision when instrument is called equity or when is it called a financial liability? Now, as I said, I'm now going to play a small little game. I hope I can ask a few questions. I, I mean, it's not necessary that everybody answers that. But I'm just going to put across one or two questions and get your inputs on that. Let's say, for example, I say a company issued equity shares. Would I say it is supposed to be an equity? Or should I say it is supposed to be a liability? As an entity, if I am going to issue instruments, 
and let's say if I issue equity shares, would I say that that is supposed to be equity or should I say that is supposed to be a liability? And I think I'm getting some inputs that it is supposed to be called equity. I think without giving names, I'm getting some inputs that it is equity. And I think everybody said it's equity. Great. Let's take another example and let's get more inputs from you. Let's say, for example, if I say a company issued a debenture. So if I say the company issued a debenture, would I say that this is supposed to be an equity or is it supposed to be a liability? So I guess I'm getting some inputs and wonderful, I think, audience who are telling me that it's a liability. Now, hear me very carefully. You know, I remember there is a very interesting phrase which says, I think that's said by Shakespeare, what's in a name? It says, what's in a name? The rose will smell as sweet as without the name rose. Now, let me tell you one thing. I'm going to change your perception towards looking at whether instrument is an equity or whether instrument is supposed to be. And that's right. I think uh, one of the inputs given is we need to look at the substance of form. That's right. Indus 32 has made one thing very clear. The name of the instrument can never, ever be a deciding factor. You know, I remember that when I was also doing my chartered accountancy or when I was in college, you know, we were always given to understand that if a company issues equity shares, I would say that yes, an equity share is supposed to be shown under equity in the balance sheet. If a company issues a bond or a debenture, it is supposed to be a liability. We used to identify, you know, the nature of the instrument, looking at the nomenclature of the instrument. When you look at the word debt, it indicates that if you're looking at a debt, then it is supposed to be a liability. So when you use a prefix called equity share capital, it seems it's an equity. Index 32 has put everything to rest. Trust me, in the next, I think, half an hour, 45 minutes, I would be able to prove you that instrument with a nomenclature called equity shares would be a debt. An instrument with a nomenclature called a debt could be an equity instrument. Or there could also be in, you know, instances where the instrument has got a blend of both a equity and a liability. That is what we technically call a compound financial instrument, but that I'll come to that later. Now, in order to make things simpler, you know what I have done? I have created a three-step procedure. So I'm going to work upon that three-step procedure in order to identify when an instrument is an equity and when an instrument is supposed to be a financial liability. But at the first instance, I'm again putting a stress on the fact that when you identify that the instrument is equity or it is supposed to be FL, please don't go by the name of the instrument. We need to look at the substance over the legal form, the terms and conditions over which things are based. So at the first instance, I have a few inputs to ask you. Let me, I think, just share my screen once again. And... So I think we started off with a quiz, and in this I said, you know, identify the nature of the instrument, and I gave you examples on equity, debentures, et cetera, and then we decided that what's in a name. So name is not an important input. Now, I think this is already dealt that there are three standards. Now, first of all, I think I'd like to take you back on the standard and show you something. I'm going to develop a particular three-step procedure because the first thing what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the definition of financial liability. So let me go back to the index 32 and look at the definition of a financial liability. It's a huge definition. But I'm going to look at certain aspects of the definition. It's going to take a little time before I build the concept, but I promise you, we're going to do some case studies also with you. And based on that, I think we will decide, is it equity or is it a financial liability? It says a financial liability is any liability. 
Though I think I need to interpret this word also, but I think I'll come to that word any later. It says a financial liability is a contractual obligation. I think I must first focus on the word, it's a contractual obligation. I think let me deal with this first of all, and then get some answers from you. Let's say, for example, my entity owes income tax to the government of India. Is that an obligation which is contractual in nature? As an entity, I am liable to pay income tax to the government, and I think we got the right inputs. No, it is not a contractual obligation. I would say it is a statutory obligation. So when you say it is a statutory obligation, it doesn't fit into the definition of a financial liability. So trust me, this is going to be step number one. But please take care that as we go to progress, as I said, I'm going to develop a three-step procedure. Is this three-step procedure something which is given in the index? No. Have I created this of my own? Yes. But trust me, it works wonderfully well. Not because that I've created it, but I think it's going to work wonderfully well. So the first question which you're going to put across in terms of any instrument is, ask yourself a question, is there a contractual obligation? Now, if the answer is a no, then I think Indus 32 is not applicable. At this stage, let me also tell you that there are various Indus where, you know, we are given that there is a contract. Like, for example, if you look at Indus 115, that also talks of a contract between a customer and a supplier. Like, for example, if you look at Indus 1116, which deals with leases, it also talks about the presence of a contract. But not every contract will come under the purview of Indus 32 or 109. So it is very important that when we look at a contract, we need to decide whether this contract is within the purview of Indus 32 or not. So the first question to look at is that, is there a contractual obligation? If you say no, Indus 32 is not applicable. But if you say a yes, then I need to go to the step number two. Now, step number two is a little technical, so hear me very well. So let me do one thing. Let me share the screen once again with you. And I'm going to ask a few questions. So based on that, we're going to develop a concept. So I'm going to first of all take you I'm going to take you to a very simple little example and get your inputs. Let's take a very simple example that Mr. A borrows one lakh from Mr. B. Look at the example very carefully. It's a very basic example to understand the concept. Let's say Mr. A borrows one lakh from Mr. B. Now, I am ignoring the interest for practical convenience. I'm assuming that Mr. A would certainly pay annual interest to Mr. B. That's a presumption. So I am only looking at the repayment of the principal amount. I put that once again. It's a very important assumption for my case study. I am considering that Mr. A has borrowed 1 lakh from Mr. B, so he would pay an annual interest every year. So I'm only concentrating on the practical, on the principal money to be repaid by Mr. A to Mr. B. Let's assume Mr. A is liable to pay this money, let's say, after a period of five years. Now, I am looking at certain possibilities. Let me, I think, elaborate the possibilities and get some inputs back from you. The question which is working in my mind is, Mr. A tells Mr. B as of today, mind the words, Mr. A tells Mr. B as of today that after a period of five years, I'm going to give you five lakhs in cash. Oh, sorry, one lakh in cash. One lakh was the principal amount. So let's say Mr. A tells Mr. B that after a period of five years, I'm going to give you one lakh rupees in cash. Would Mr. B accept this money? Will Mr. B have any reservations in terms of accepting cash, except that if you start thinking in terms of demonetization, 
And if except, you know, you start thinking that how I'm going to handle cash, that's another story. But, but would Mr. B be apprehensive in terms of accepting cash? That's right, he said, no. Mr. B would not have any apprehensions in terms of accepting cash of one lakh rupees. Uh, I think some inputs coming, there is a time value money, but for that purpose, I'm ignoring the concept of interest. I've already made a presumption that Mr. A is going to pay the annual interest to Mr. B over a period of five years. So I think that would take care of the concept of time value of money. So I am you know, more looking at the fact that the principal money is to be paid after five years. So if Mr. A tells Mr. B that I'm going to pay you cash of one lakh rupees at the end of five years, I guess B would not have a problem, right? Number two, let's say Mr. A tells Mr. B that instead of giving you a cash, I'm going to give you a check. So I'll give you a check worth one lakh rupees at the end of five years. I don't see that Mr. B would again have any problem. You know, getting a cash or getting a check is like getting a currency note. So I think Mr. B would be quite comfortable in terms of accepting the same. Now, let me tell you one thing, a little technical. Mr. A tells Mr. B. Now, this is something which you need to carefully analyze. Mr. A tells Mr. B, as of today, that I will give you equity shares in my company. Mr. A is telling Mr. B that after five years, I'll give you shares in my company. And he says that I need to pay you one lakh rupees. And let's say the price of the share today is let's say 500 rupees. So he immediately divides one lakh by 500 and tells Mr. B that I'll give you a total of 200 shares. So he predetermines the number of shares which Mr. A would give to Mr. B. Do you think Mr. B would accept the offer? Mr. A is telling Mr. B as of today that I need to pay you one lakh after a period of five years, but the number of shares to be given to you will be predecided as of today. Now it's your good fortune, it's your bad luck if the share prices crashes after a period of five years. And I think I'm getting some inputs that B would not accept the offer. Can I put it like this, that B may accept, or B may not accept? I'll give you a reason for that. And I think that's really said, well, yes, it depends. I would put it like this, that Mr. B, you know, would or may or may not accept the offer. There are two situations. Mr. B is very confident of the fact that the price of the shares of company A would increase massively. Then I think there is all the possibility that B would accept these shares. But then let's say on the other hand, B is feeling that the price of A shares is going to drastically come down. He doesn't want to take that risk. So in that particular case, he would refuse to accept the shares. So I would not say that if A offers, you know, to discharge the liability in terms of shares, then Mr. B would outrightly refuse. I would say it all depends upon how Mr. B views that the price of the shares would A would increase or not. So whether he is you know, willing to take a risk or not, that would decide whether he may accept or not. So I would say, unlike a cash, unlike a check, where Mr. B would not refuse, but when it comes to a predetermined number of shares, there is a possibility that B may accept or may not accept. Let's take another situation. Now, in the fourth possibility, Mr. A tells Mr. B that I need to pay you one lakh rupees after a period of five years. So he says it's not fair enough to decide the number of shares to be given today. We will decide the number of shares at a later date. So he says, let's do one thing. We will wait for the price of the share at the end of five years. And whatever is the price at the end of five years, we'll take that to decide the number of shares. So let's say, if after a period of five years, the price of the share is 250, then I divide it by 250 and give him 400 shares. Let's say if the price of the share after a period of five years is let's say 500, then I divide by 500 and I will give 200 shares. So I am keeping the number of shares variable. In my third case, it was a fixed number which was a predetermined, and I think that's the right input. 
I think I'm getting the input that yes, Mr. B would now accept the offer. Is Mr. B running any kind of risk in this particular situation? I would say no. Because Mr. B is assured that he would get as many shares, the value of those shares will equal the amount of one lakh rupees. Now, there is something more which I need to elaborate. I think I'm going to first say a few inputs to you. Then I will also give you the logic of India's 32. You know, I am going with a presumption that we need to understand from the very basics. So I'm keeping my examples also absolutely down to the core. So I give you a total of four situations. Let me just evaluate the four situations or the possibility. When Mr. A tells Mr. B that I'll pay you cash, Mr. B would agree. When Mr. A tells Mr. B that I will pay you a check, Mr. B agree. When Mr. A told Mr. B that I will give you a fixed number of shares, which is pre-decided today, then Mr. B said I may or may not accept. But when Mr. A told Mr. B that I will give you a number of shares which is variable to be decided on the date when the number is to be given, Mr. B would accept the deal. Now let me say something. I'll give you the logic also. If Mr. B agrees to accept cash, it's a financial liability. If Mr. B accepts a check, it's a financial liability. If Mr. B says, I will accept the fixed number of shares, it's an equity instrument. And if Mr. B accepts to accept a variable number of shares, it's a financial liability again. I know, now you would say, am I indirectly trying to say that in step number two, that I am looking at the mode of the payment? Am I looking at how would you discharge this contractual obligation? Yes. My first question was looking into the fact that is there a contractual obligation? My second input relates to the fact that is this contractual obligation, what is the medium, what is the mode of payment? So if the mode of payment is supposed to be cash or a check, then it is a financial liability. If the mode of payment is equity share, I think let me break this and go to step number three. I think we'll go on a step-by-step -step basis. It becomes more comfortable to crack down things. So I think I've developed a three-step procedure. Let me, I think, put this. As I said, is there a contractual obligation? I said, yes. Then I went to the next step and I said that this contractual obligation will be discharged in which medium? What is the mode of payment? I said it's cash. Then I said it's a financial liability. If I said it's equity shares, I said let's go to the step number three. And in terms of step number three, you need to apply what we technically call a fixed test. What we technically call a fixed test, this is a nomenclature given by the International Accounting Standard Board that we will apply a fixed test and decide is the number of equity shares to be given fixed in number, pre-decided in number, then it is an equity instrument. And if it is supposed to be, you know, a variable number of share, then it is a financial liability. I hope, I trust that you would have got a flair in terms of a three-step procedure, but I think we're still looking for a little logic that what is the logic in terms of this particular concept? Let me take you back on the school days. And I think let me ex explain why we say it's a liability or why do we say it is an equity instrument. I think I've got another two questions to put across. I remember the main distinction between an own funds and a loan funds. You know, if you look at the substance of the transaction, I remember when I was in school, we were given a very basic input in terms of deciding what is a loan and a own funds, and that was the return, and that was the principal repayment. We were given a fact that in terms of a loan, there is always an annual return which is paid. And in terms of a loan, there is always, you know, an element of repayment of the principal as well. An entity which issues the instrument would always promise that I'm going to pay you an annual return, I'm also going to give you the principal money back. 
But you know, this is not there in terms of equity. In terms of equity, as an issuing entity, I never promise that I'll give you any kind of returns. Even if I earn profits, I'm not entitled that I would give you any kind of dividends. So there is a complete absence of any principal repayment unless the company liquidates. There is a complete absence in terms of giving any kind of annual returns as well. So let me ask this question in a different manner, looking at a risk factor. Imagine a company A issues equity shares and tells the holder that I will not pay you any dividends. I will not pay your money back until the company liquidates. Does the issuing company undertake a risk? or is the risk taken by the investor, the holder? So when as an issuing company, you would issue an equity share and you would tell the other person that I'm not going to give you any kind of returns, I'm not going to give you any kind of repayment of the principal, that means there is no risk which is taken by the issuer. And let me remind you, when the risk is not on the issuer, it is called an equity. And that's right. So we can say when the risk is taken by the holder, it is equity. Or alternatively, I could say the risk is not taken by the issuer. But on the other hand, when a company issues a debenture, for example, and tells the holder that I'm going to pay you annual interest every year, I'm going to make a repayment of your principal money also at the end of each year. Does this put a risk on the issuer that you are contractually obliged to give a interest even if you don't earn profits? You're contractually obliged to repay the principal money after a certain number of years? Yes. So I would say that when you look at a equity instrument or liability, the main distinction criteria is who bears the risk. As we always say that owners always bear a risk. So when a company issues an equity instrument, the risk is on the owner, the holder. The risk is not on the issuer. But when the instrument is issued and the issuer itself takes a risk, the investor doesn't take a risk, then in that particular case, it becomes a liability. I think if I try to correlate this concept in terms of my example, you would easily vouch me. When Mr. A promises Mr. B that I'll give you cash, when Mr. A promises Mr. B that I'll give you a check, is it indirectly telling that Mr. A is bearing a risk because he says that whatever may happen, I'm going to pay you one lakh rupees after the end of five years, so he is bearing a risk. And if he's bearing a risk, then in this particular case, we should undoubtedly call it as a financial liability. So the more okay, important factor in terms of taking a decision, whether it's a debt, whether it's a equity. But now imagine when Mr. A told Mr. B that I'm going to give you a fixed number of shares. I'm going to give you a pre-decided number of shares. In that particular case, the question arises, if Mr. A is telling that I give you fixed number of shares, he is putting Mr. B to a risk. He is indirectly telling Mr. B that, you know, if the share performs well, you're lucky. If the share doesn't perform well, you are unlucky. So this is shifted from Mr. A to Mr. B. And when the risk is getting shifted, then the nature of the instrument is supposed to be what? It is supposed to become a equity instrument. So giving the obligation, settling the obligation in terms of fixed number that is a predetermined number of shares would make the instrument to be in the nature of an equity instrument. On the other hand, if you look at the possibility in terms of the fourth one, Mr. A tells Mr. B that I'll give you as many shares, which is going to give you that one lakh rupee. Then the risk is on the hands of Mr. A itself. He is saying that I'll give you as many shares so that you get your money back. So you can see the essence in terms of taking a decision whether an instrument is equity or whether it is supposed to be an FL is purely based on the risk. So I can say if the risk falls upon the issuer, it's an FL. If the risk falls upon the holder, then it is supposed to be an equity instrument. But then there can be possibilities also. 
you know, where you could see that the risk is being, you know, shared in a certain proportion. The issuer, you know, passes on a certain level of risk on the holder, then such instruments could be a blend in terms of a debt, that is a financial liability and equity. But I think I'm going to discuss that part later. I hope I am clear with the concept in terms of how I would apply my three-step procedure. I know this is very complicated. In fact, when I was asked, you know, what topic I want to speak on, you know, I said I'm going to speak on the most technical topic on NDAs, and that is financial instruments. Though I think it's worth sometimes taking a risk. I really don't know whether I took a real good risk or not. And I think Sapil has got a question. So what if, uh, okay, I think uh, I just need to go to your question. Uh, I think uh, there are two blends of questions going on. I don't know which one to look at actually. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Sapnil, I think had some question. I missed out your question. It gets popped in, but I couldn't really see that. Okay, so let me just zero down again on my three-step procedure to you. Then I think we can start working a little more on the three-step procedure because I'm yet to introduce some more finer details on this particular concept. As I said, it's going to be a three-step procedure. Step number one, is there a contractual obligation? I said, no, I'm not applying India's 32. I said, uh, yes, then I go to, and okay, I think your chart is, uh, approach is wonderful. Okay, thank you for the inputs. I think that's a lovely, put me, you know, worth, I think worth taking risk, I guess. So I think I took the risk as a holder, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, it's a three-step procedure. Number one, I said, is there a contractual obligation? I said, no. Then in this 32 is not applicable. If I said a yes, then I go to the step number two. When I go to the step number two, then I put across the question, what is the mode of settlement? What is the mode of payment? Now, if you say the mode of payment is a cash or a check, it's undoubtedly a financial liability. But if you say the mode of payment is supposed to be, let's say, in equity shares, I shift my focus to the step number three. And for the time being, I said you're going to conduct a fixed test. A fixed test means you are going to take a decision. Is the number of equity shares to be issued fixed or not? If it is supposed to be fixed in nature, then it is equity. And if it is variable, then it is supposed to be uh, financial liability. I think I'm getting some question. Uh, what would you call the stocks for an issuer who has an obligation to pay 80% income as dividends, annually equity financial liability for the company? Uh, I would be able to answer your question a little time. I think give me another 15, 20 minutes, I'm just going to come to that concept also, where I'm going to introduce some more complexities in that particular issue. But I think in the first instance, I am now again to share my three-step procedure. And I think let me show you a three-step procedure which I have created. This is in cuts what I have created as a three-step procedure. I said in step number one, though my step number three is still incomplete, but I'm still going to read my three step. I said in step number one, is there a contractual obligation? I said, no. Then I said, in this 32 is not applicable. I said, if there is a contractual obligation, you need to go to the step number two. In step number two, you will ask yourself, what is the mode of payment? Now you would also say, that mode of payments could be a blend of cash and equity? Yes, but I think we'll come to that a little later. So we said, let's assume that the mode of payment is a cash. If it is cash, it is undoubtedly a financial liability. If it is equity shares, you go to the step number three. Now, I am yet to give a little more inputs on my step number three. But for this purpose, I need to take you back on the definition of index 32 once again. Now, I'm going to show you a few things again on the definition. Please don't see anything extra. If you're going to see something extra, then it's your risk, not my risk. 
then it's going to be an equity instrument for you. So I am reading the definition. It says a financial liability is any liability that is a contractual obligation to deliver cash. You would have noticed that I made my two steps out of the clause A and from the clause 1. From the clause A, I asked myself a question, is there a contractual obligation? From the point number one, I asked myself that are you going to deliver cash? Now I'm going a little further, skipping the clause number two, but I'm going to the clause number B. It says a contract that will or may be settled in entity's own equity instruments. Now, I'm looking at the clause number one. I'm reading in between the clause number one and B1. It says the entity will deliver a variable number of equity instruments. This is called conducting a fixed test. Well, you would say that if you're going to issue a variable number of equity instruments, then only I can call this as a financial liability. So if you're going to issue a fixed number of equity instruments, then it is called an equity instrument. Now you would notice then in clause number B1 and in clause number B2, you can see that clause number B1 says a non-derivative and a clause number A says it's a derivative. Now, let me explain something. Now I am going to go a little technical. I hope I can do that. Now when you go to the step number three, where you say that the obligation will be discharged through equity shares. You need to first of all take a decision, is the instrument derivative or is it non-derivative? It's not that the entire instrument is derivative in nature. There is what we technically call a derivative embedded in the instrument. I think, let me take an example to illustrate this. Let's say, for example, a company issues an instrument which has got an option to convert to equity shares. I'm being very clear with my language. I'm saying, let's say a company issues an instrument, it issues a debenture, where it gives an option to convert to equity share. Is the presence of this option indicates a derivative which is embedded in the instrument, in simple words, included in the instrument, Though we technically say that there is a derivative which is embedded. And the answer, of course, is a yes. So when you see that there is an instrument which contains a derivative, there is a need to apply a fixed for a fixed test. Then the fixed test will not apply. The moment the instrument becomes a derivative, I need to apply a fixed for a fixed test. Don't get worried on what is that fix for fixed test. This is again a name which is given by the International Accounting Standard Board. They have given a name called a fixed test which is meant for a non-derivative and there is a test called a fixed for a fixed test which is meant for a derivative. Let's take another example. When a company issues, let's say for example, a share warrant, is a share warrant supposed to be a derivative? I think let's get that inputs from you. What do you say? When a company would issue, let's say for example, a share warrant, would that be considered as an instrument which is a derivative in nature? Well, I think a share warrant again gives an option to the holder. It gives an option to the holder that he may or may not acquire the shares against the warrant. It is again, it is derivative in nature. So we need to first of all zero down on the fact that when you are going to settle your obligations by way of equity shares, you need to decide first of all, is the instrument derivative or is it non-derivative in nature? I think let me now concentrate on a derivative. But at the same time, let me also tell you one inputs which people generally have a misconception. If there is an instrument which is mandatorily convertible into equity shares, if a company would issue an instrument where they would tell the holder that I would 100% confirmed convert into equity share, it is not a derivative. Because that instrument does not contain an option. That instrument is supposed to be 
definitely mandatory conversion itself. That's non-derivative in nature. Now let's take an example to understand the concept of what we call a fixed for a fixed test. Let's say, for example, a company issued a share warrant tells the holder that you are you will get one share against one warrant and you need to pay us 150 per share. So the company tells the holder that against the share warrant, you will get one share for every one warrant and you go to pay 150 per share. We need to look at the two things. One is called the consideration and one is the number of equity share. What does the company get against the warrant? It is going to get a fixed consideration of 150. And how many shares will it issue against it? It will issue a total of one share. Is the number of equity shares issued fixed in number? Yes. Is the consideration which the company is going to get is also fixed in number? Yes. Then it is supposed to be an equity instrument. If the consideration or if the number of equity instruments, either of the two becomes variable, it is going to become derivative in nature. In those cases, we say you either meet a fixed for a variable test, you meet a variable for a fixed test, you meet a variable for a variable test, and so on. I know some of you would be thinking that this is really technical indeed. You must be thinking, you know, that this is really complex indeed. And as compared to what we have done in IGAP, this is really complicated. Yes. Trust me, financial instruments as a standard changed my entire perception towards accounting. And I realized how important it is to see the substance over a legal form. I think let me explain that once again. So I said, when you look at an instrument which is a derivative, you would conduct a fixed for a fixed test. So when I say fixed for a fixed test, there are two words fixed. One is a word fixed which is meant for consideration. Another is the word fixed which is meant for number of equity instruments. If the consideration is fixed, and the number of equity shares to be issued against the consideration fixed, then it is equity instrument. Any of the two becomes variable in nature, then it is going to be a financial liability. So either the consideration is variable, or the number of equity share is variable, or both the consideration and the number is variable, it becomes a financial liability. So I think let's Come back to the step number three. I think it's time to do some case studies with you because application is very important. So I'm going to first of all bring you to some case studies, but before that, let me just get my find three steps in front of a mind. So we said now we are going to apply a three step procedure. So if you're going to say in the step number one, Kabul hai, in the step number two, Kabul hai, in the step number three, Kabul hai. Well, it's not that a nikah is going to take place. We're going to decide, you know, it's a financial liability or equity instrument. Well, that was just on a lighter side. So, as I said, that there is a three-step procedure. Let me work on that. Step number one. And I think we've got a question. I think, how would you classify a bond issued by a yes pack? Wonderful, sir. I think I'm just going to answer that. Let me just retreat this three-step. Then I'm going to answer two questions to you, which will take care of your question. You know, because I know I think it's time to prove that a debt can be an equity and equity can be a debt. I'll prove that two minutes. So let me first get my three steps very clear. The step number one, is there a contractual obligation? No. Outside the purview of India's 32. Yes, you go to the step number two. In the step number two, I put across a question to myself. That is, what is the mode of payment? Is it equity? Sorry, is it first take cash or equity? If you say it is cash, undoubtedly financial liability. If you say it is supposed to be equity, go to the step number three. Now decide, is it derivative or is it non-derivative? 
If it is non-derivative, you need to conduct a fixed test. Only look at the number of equity share. If the number of equity share is fixed, equity, variable, then it is FL, financial liability. Similarly, if it is a derivative instrument, you look at the fixed for a fixed test. If both are fixed, equity, and one is variable, it's financial liability. I think now let me come back to the question which I think somebody has got. And you know, we're getting some very interesting questions now. Let me first answer the first query, then I'll come to the next one as well. I'm going to now give you two inputs. Let's see your reactions. A company issued a bond. Is it a liability or an equity? A company issued a bond. Is it liability or is it equity? And I think there we get the answer. It's a liability. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, for the last one hour, I have been trying to explain one thing. Never, ever look at the name of the instrument. This is what India's 32 teaches us. I remember, you know, I would love the idea when the schools in India are going to change the entire perception. Uh, yes, uh, Pradeep, sir, I'll just come back to you on that agenda. But remember the very first important lesson that if you are given that a company borrowed 10 lakhs, never ever decide, never ever decide that it's a liability. The name, the wordings are not important. It is the terms and conditions which are important. So if I would say that a company took a loan, I can't say it's a debt. The terms will be the deciding factor, model of the story which I said earlier, what's in a day? Okay, let me now continue with the same example. Let's say a company issued a bond and the bond is issued where you tell the holder that I will pay the entire money with interest at the end of five years in fixed number of equity shares. I put that again. A company issued a bond and said to the holder that we will pay the entire money with interest at the end of five years and we pre-decide the number of equity shares to be given to you. And I think that's wonderfully decided. It is undoubtedly equity instrument in nature. So can you see the name of the instrument is supposed to be a bond, but then it turns out to be an equity instrument. Because you pre-decided to give the fixed number of shares. Though I could have gone through the three step looking at is there a contractual obligation? We are discharging in shares. Let's take another example to make it more clear. Let's say, for example, a company issued a bond and told the holder that we will pay the entire money with interest at the end of five years. The number of shares to be given will be decided at a later date. When we need to pay you the money after five years, we will decide the number of shares at that stage. And that's right. It is supposed to be a financial liability because the number of equity instruments issued is supposed to be variable in number. So what is the most important factor in terms of deciding things is that whether an instrument will be given discharged in terms of cash or equity shares, is it going to be fixed or variable? Human mind is very complex. And trust me, you know, what you've learned so far is not very complex. And when industry, you know, would get an understanding of these kind of things, plethora of instruments will come into life. And you would see that in a practical life situation, which, you know, I've also seen during the course of my audit, that companies would issue instruments like OCD, they would issue instruments like CCCPS, and varied instruments with triggering conditions of conversions at different places. I think it may not be, you know, one session of course, of course, is not enough in terms of giving you all the nitty gritties. So I'm just giving a little working knowledge. But, you know, if you come to those kind of complex instruments, it's very difficult to take a decision in a go without looking at every term and condition attached to the instrument, whether it is equity or a financial liability. I think one of the participants had a question, how would you say that a bond issued by Yes Bank would be? What's in a name? I really don't know, unless I would go through 
the terms and conditions related to the bond, one cannot give any conclusive decision whether it's a liability or it's an equity instrument. Now, let me do one very interesting discussion with you. You know, when a company issues equity shares, it can have two kinds of features attached to an equity share. One is called puttable and one is called non-puttable. I think let me explain that what is a puttable or a non-puttable, though I guess many of you would know that. But I think just to recreate that what is a puttable or a non-puttable instrument. When an entity issues, let's say for example, a puttable instrument that would entitle the holder to put the instrument back to the issuer. And where the holder will get entitled to get the principal money back. That means a company issues puttable equity shares to the holder and it entitles the holder with a contractual right to put the instrument back to the company and ask for the principal money. Would this mean that the issuing company would have a contractual obligation to pay? Yes, of course. And do you think that such instruments would turn out to be equity instruments or do you think they would turn out to be a financial liability? When you go to issue, you know, such kind of instruments which would entitle the holder to put the instrument back to the issuer and you go to ask for money, yes, that is a financial liability. You know, many startup companies are organized in such a way that they issue equity shares which are puttable in nature. And these kind of instruments would turn out to be a financial liability and not an equity instrument. So which would mean that the financial statements as it is would get, you know, very, they will never be relevant and reliable in nature. Because we are not looking at the substance of the transaction. So it is very important to look at the terms. And I think with these two examples, you would have noticed that I've already proved my point. I took one example where the name was a bond, but I proved it that it is supposed to be equity instrument. I took another example where I said it's a puttable ordinary shares, but I said it's a financial liability. So I am pretty sure you would all agree that what's in a name. I think I've got some interesting case studies now. And I think let's show some case studies to you. And I think let's get some valid inputs so that at least I can get an idea that are we standing at the same platform? Then I'm going to take you further. And I'm going to introduce you to the concept of a compound financial instrument where the instruments will have a features of a liability as well as in features of equity. So let's, I think, take it further. Let me just uh, share the inputs further again with you. So I'm going to take you to a small little case study on this. Let's have a look at this particular example. It says C limited issues convertible debentures to R for a subscription of 100 crores. You know, if I was not knowing India's, I would have easily decided that this is a debt. But of course, with the understanding on the India's, I think the name debenture has got no meaning to me. It says C limited issues convertible debentures for 100 crores. And those debentures are convertible after five years into equity share using a predetermined formula. Let me caution. It's not a predetermined number. It's a predetermined formula. It's a predetermined formula. And I think I've got a very valid input on that. And if you look at the formula very carefully, you can see that 100 crores is being compounded at the rate of 10% for a period of five years. You know, you can see that 100 crores is being compounded at the rate of 10% for a period of five years, and we are dividing it by the fair value on the date of conversion. And I think you're getting some very wonderful inputs. I think such a wonderful audience, and I think your concepts are working so well. But I would still like to, you know, add a little further inputs on this case. I think let me go step by step in order to illustrate my inputs to you. Number one. Is the issuer has a contractual obligation? Yes. 
Number two, what is the mode of payment? I would say the mode of payment in this case is the equity shares. And now I need to go to the step number three and decide is it derivative or is it non-derivative in nature? Can I ask you in all sincerity, did you actually decide that it's a derivative or a non-derivative? I would love your candid opinions on that. I knew this. Uh, thank you for the candid opinions on this. You know, when I looked at the answer, I could guess that, you know, we have got to the conclusion simply looking at the formula itself. And, you know, I said a few things which I'm going to now add on. In my example, if you notice, it was a mandatory conversion. It was a mandatory conversion. I think let me just show the example once again. And once you're going to look at this, you'll surely realize the same. It says those debentures are convertible into equity share. It's a mandatory conversion. If it is supposed to be a mandatory conversion, it is supposed to be a non-derivative contract. And if it is a non-derivative contract, then I am applying a fixed test. And if I'm applying a fixed test, I would see is the number of shares to be issued fixed in number or not. And we can see that the number of shares to be given is variable because you are calculating the number of shares based on the fair value as on the date of conversion. So this would make it as a financial liability. I think let's look at another example. Let's have a look at another example, and I think you could decide your inputs on that. It says D issues convertible debentures to J for 100 crores. These debentures are convertible after five years into 15 crore shares. And I think I'm already getting some good inputs that it is supposed to be equity. But let me also ask you that is it a derivative or a non-derivative? It's a very good performance. I think everybody has given very wonderful answers. So I think that's absolutely correct that it is 100% an equity instrument. And I think we got a little mixed response that it's a derivative or it's a non-derivative. Now, the debentures are convertible. When you say they are convertible, it again indicates it's a mandatory conversion. And when it is supposed to be a mandatory conversion, it is a non-derivative instrument. So here again, I would apply a fixed test in this case, and it is already pre-decided that 15 crore shares will be issued to discharge the obligation. And I think that undoubtedly makes it as a equity instrument because you've already pre-decided the number of shares. That's brilliant indeed. I think let's go to another example with you. I think now this is a very interesting one. Let's have a look. Okay, I think Hadik, I think you got a question. I didn't get the concept of uh, equity. Okay, let me just elaborate. I think somebody also asked me to explain the concept of a derivative. Now this might get a little technical, but I think I'll still like to answer that question. You know, technically speaking, if I were to decide whether instrument contains a derivative or not, there are a total of three features of a derivative. I don't want to get into that technicality, but I think since, you know, you asked me, requested me to elaborate, I'll do that. You know, when you say a derivative, a derivative has got a total of three features. One is the instrument derives its value from an underlying asset. Second, there is no investment which is required at an initial stage. Either there is zero investment or there is a negligible investment at the initial stage for getting that option. And number three, there has to be a future settlement. I think let's take an example of a share warrant. I think that's the easiest way to understand. Let's say, for example, if a company issues a share warrant, if a company issues a share warrant, is there any initial investment? No. Is there going to be a future settlement? Yes. And number three, is the share warrant deriving its value from underlying asset from the equity shares? You know, whether the holder would exercise the share warrant or not would all depend upon how the price of the equity share fares. 
So the value of that derivative, the value of the warrant is being derived from the price of the share. That's one. There is no initial investment. That's two. And there is going to be a future settlement as well. If you fulfill all these features, then you can say it is supposed to be a derivative in nature. But let me also tell you that generally, I'm saying generally, one could zero down with a very small little litmus test. Now, this is purely a litmus test. It is not a conceptual test. And the litmus test is that if you see any presence of option in a contract, generally, I'm being very careful in my words, generally, it would mean that it is supposed to be a derivative. So when I say it's a mandatory conversion, you are not giving an option. Then in that particular case, there is no option, so there is no derivative. When you say there is an option to convert, and I guess you said, somebody said ESOP would be a derivative. Of course, yes. And ESOP is also, you know, which gives you an option. Whether the option is with the issuer or whether the option of the instrument is with the holder, that would not make any difference. So generally, when you apply a litmus test and you see that there is supposed to be an option in a contract, I would say it is including a derivative. I'm not saying that the entire instrument is going to be derivative in nature. I'm only saying that there is a derivative which is embedded inside the instrument. So in my previous examples, I was clearly looking at a mandatory conversion. When it's a mandatory conversion, we would always zero down on the fact that it's a non-derivative. But if there is an option to convert, then there is a presence of a derivative. I'm not getting into the derivative in detail, because that's another very interesting area, which is covered by India's 109, that when a derivative embedded in the instrument is separated or not. Because in a practical life situations, we see many instruments which are issued with an option to convert with the issuer or holder, and there is a need to segregate the derivative in those cases, but one needs to watch out carefully whether we would segregate that embedded derivative or not. I hope that answers uh, the query of my learned friend. Okay, so I think let me come back and I think share another question with you and then we can take it a little further and we go to some more inputs on a compound financial instruments with you. So let's have a look at the example. It says A limited issues a warrants to all existing shareholders entitling them to purchase additional equity shares it says 100 rupees is the face value at an issue price 150 per share. The first question what comes to the mind is, is it a derivative or is it a non-derivative? It says A issued a warrants to all the existing holders entitling them to purchase. So naturally it's got an option. And I think I'm getting still a little missed input. Most of the answer, of course, are derivative in nature. Yes, I think I made it clear. The presence of an option is a clear-cut case that it is derivative in nature, rightly said. So that means I need to apply a fixed for a fixed test. And if I need to apply a fixed for a fixed test, then in this particular case, I'm looking at a limited is going to get a consideration 150 rupees per share. Is the consideration fixed? Yes. A limited will issue one share against each warrant. So is the number of equity instrument issued fixed? Yes. And that's why we said this is equity instrument in nature. Now, I know the questions which might be bubbling into your mind is, can we get some more examples where, you know, we would fail a fix for a fixed test? Well, I've not kept too many complicated examples at the moment because the standard as it is is a very complex one. And I don't want to complex it too far. But I guess we would have at least, you know, understood the main inputs with you. I think before I take it further, I think let's take a little input further and we're now going to dig more into financial. So far so good. I think I have understood one particular aspect. Rather, I hope you've all understood one particular aspect. And I think input. So could you explain this last one again? Yes. In my example on a share warrant, it was issuing one share 
against one warrant and at a fixed price of 150. In a fixed for a fixed test, we need to take a decision. Is the number of equity instruments which the issuer will issue, is it fixed? I said I'll issue one share for one warrant. So number of equity instrument to be issued is fixed. Number two, we said, is the consideration which the issuing company going to receive, is that fixed? I'm going to get 150 rupees per share. So the consideration is also fixed. So the consideration received is fixed. The number of equity share to be issued against is fixed. Since the consideration and the number is fixed, it becomes a financial liability. Any one of the component becomes variable, either the consideration or the number, it is going to be a financial liability. Okay, I think, uh, so Vijay, you said, sir, non-derivative treatment again. I think let me put the chronological steps once again with you. In a journey, since I am a practitioner along with an academician, you know, generally the level of hours which I spend on attaining a, you know, a proficiency on this kind of a standard ranges from almost like, you know, 25, 30 hours at least. But I think in this particular case, since I am given a constructive obligation, putting it in inverted commas, to explain things, it really becomes a little challenge. But I think let me, but I think we're going wonderfully well. So I think let me just little sum up the inputs again before we go further. I think we have understood one thing very clear, which is, I think, embedded deep into our minds. And one is, is the name of the instrument of any relevance to you in terms of deciding that it is to be presented as an equity or presented as a financial liability? And the big answer is no. I think we've learned the very important lesson that the nature of the instrument is to be evaluated. The terms and conditions need to be evaluated. And for this particular purpose, I've given you a three-step procedure. Now, in terms of a three-step procedure, which I have created of my own, based on the definition, and I understand India's 32 very well, uh, Himanshu sir, that's great. So that's, that's really great, I think, for the acknowledgement. Uh, so is this uh, the post-mortem, the post-analysis of what we have covered so far, or is this something which was a, a pre-analysis of what you've done? <laughs> so is this uh, something? Uh, please share the email ID. I'll also do that. I have a slide where I'm going to share my number and my uh, email address also definitely with all the participants. So in this particular case, I develop a three-step procedure, and in terms of the three-step procedure, we've zeroed down on step number one. Is there a contractual obligation? I said no. Then I said in this 32, not applicable. If I say the answer is yes, I need to go to the step number two. And in terms of step number two, we will take a decision, what is the mode of payment? The mode of payment for the time being, I'm considering it is either cash or share. Now, you would say it could be a blend as well. I'm just going to come to that. So if it is only share, it's a financial liability. If it is supposed to be only equity shares, you got to go to the step number three, which is the most crucial again. When you need to decide the nature of the instrument, is that supposed to be a derivative or is that supposed to be a non-derivative? Now, what is the litmus test which will decide whether it is derivative or is it non-derivative in nature? The decision is going to be taken on the basis of generally option. So if I see that there is an option to convert, then I would say that generally it has got a derivative present in it. If it is a non-derivative instrument, you apply a fixed test. You only look at the number of equity share issued is fixed or not. If it is fixed, it is equity. If it is variable, it's financial liability. But if it is supposed to be a derivative instrument, you need to apply a fixed for a fixed test. And when you look at a fixed for a fixed test, then in that particular case, we need to consider if both the consideration and the number of equity share is fixed, then it is equity. Otherwise, it becomes a financial liability. So this is in crux of what we've discussed so far. So I guess now we can take it a little further. Now, 
I think when Manoj sir was speaking, and I think he put a, a little constructive obligation on my part as well. You're welcome, sir. Uh, Vijay sir. So he put a little constructive obligation at my end when he was discussing about the concept of preference shares in India. And I think it, it goes without doubt that I need to elaborate on the concept of preference shares in India. Of course, I'm ignoring the view of the Companies Act for the time being, because you could also tell me that under the Companies Act, the provisions are different, but I'm looking at purely based on the India's perspective. Now, let me come to another very important agenda. You know, we said in the very first step that is there a contractual obligation? And now focusing on the word obligation. It takes me again back to the school days when the obligation was a composition of two things. An obligation was a composition of the return in form of interest and dividend, and the obligation was in terms of the principal competence. So when a company would issue a debenture or a company would issue a preference share, there are two kinds of obligation. One is an obligation in terms of, I can say, redemption terms. And one is an obligation which I would say is in terms of distribution terms. Now, let me just share the slides once again to you. And I'm going to develop some very interesting concept based on this. And I said, if you were to decide an instrument has got a liability, and equity element, you need to evaluate it from redemption terms and distribution terms both. I would say from a redemption point of view, there is either redeemable instrument or it is irredeemable instrument. If an instrument is redeemable, then there is a contractual obligation to pay. Only from the redemption perspective, it is a financial liability component. Hear me very carefully. I said if an instrument is evaluated from a redemption point of view, it's like, you know, that there are two components of the instrument. One of the components of the instrument is from a redemption perspective, and one of the component is from a distribution perspective. So if I say the instrument is redeemable, I would say it is a financial liability. That component is a financial liability. If I say it is irredeemable in nature, then I would say it is supposed to be an equity instrument from a redemption perspective. Similarly, when you look at from a distribution terms, I would say if it is a mandatory distribution of dividends, then it is a financial liability component. But let's say if the dividends are discretionary in the hands of the issuer, then in that particular case, it will become an equity component. I think, let me elaborate this a little further. I think, let me put across a few questions also, and you can take a decision. When I'm looking at a preference share, for example, I would look at the redemption terms, and I would look at the distribution terms. We will take an independent decision for a redemption component and an independent decision from a distribution perspective. If you say that the redemption component is FL, and you say that the distribution component is FL, FL plus FL will make it FL. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Let me take an example. A company issued a redeemable preference share, which is redeemable on a specified date. Then from a redemption perspective, it is a financial liability. So that component from a redemption point of view is an FL. On the other hand, the issuer company said that as far as the dividends are concerned, they are going to be purely discretionary in nature. So they've got no contractual obligation to pay any kind of dividends. Then I would say in that particular case, it becomes equity instrument. So from the redemption perspective, it's an FL. From the distribution perspective, it's an equity. You merge the two, it becomes a CFI. So one could evaluate on a per se level the features of the instrument from a redemption perspective, from a distribution perspective, and take a decision. I think let's do one thing. 
let's take a very simple exercise. Let's give you two, three examples. And why don't you decide that the instrument is going to be what nature? A company issued redeemable instrument with a mandatory dividend. The company said on a preference share, we will issue a redeemable instrument and there is going to be a mandatory dividends as well. So can I say from both the point of view, that's rightly said, it becomes a FL and a FL, it becomes an FL, super. Okay, let's take another variation. Now, this is a very interesting example I'm going to take where preference shares in India could turn out to be let us say an equity instruments. My company issued irredeemable instruments and telling the instrument holder that if I pay a dividend to my equity shareholders, you also get a dividend. So I say that I am going to give you dividend if I pay a dividend to my equity shareholders and that's why he said it's equity. From a redemption point of view, it is supposed to be equity, it's irredeemable. And you're telling this person that you get a dividend only when I declare a dividend to the equity. As it is to the equity, it's a discretionary dividend. So if to the equity, it's discretionary, undoubtedly, even I'm not going to pay the dividend to the current instrument holder. So in terms of instruments which are like preferences or debentures, which would involve a redemption and a distribution aspects, one would need to zero down on the fact that from a redemption perspective, is it equity, is it liability from distribution? If it is FL, FL, FL. If it is FL, EI, CFI. And if it is EI, EI, it is supposed to be an equity. Okay, I think, Asa, ma'am, can you explain the distribution aspect? I'll do that once again. I think let's take an example. I think that would be better. So let me, I think, share an example with you. And I think we can get some more inputs based on that. Let's have a look at this particular example. It says A issues preference shares to B. The preference shares are redeemable at the end of 10 years. I guess from the redemption point of view, since it is redeemable at the end of a specified date, I would call this as a financial liability component and entitle the holder to a cumulative dividend and which is commensurate according to the risk profile. So I would say that there is a cumulative dividend, which means there is an unavoidable contractual obligation. Uh, yeah, I think Vinod, sir, I'll, I'll just come back to you. So in this particular case, we can say, that it is a FL from the point of view of redemption and it is a FL from the point of view of distribution. So FL plus FL is going to make it as FL. I think let's take another example. It says silver issued irredeemable preference shares. I know as for the company's act, we cannot do that, but just for the understanding perspective, a company issues a irredeemable preference shares so from a redemption perspective, I would say it's equity component. And these shares will carry 8% dividend, but the dividend is going to be paid only when you give it to the equity shares. You're telling these preference shareholders that you get a dividend when I pay a dividend on the equity shares. So what do you say from a distribution perspective? Can I again say it is equity? So from a redemption, it's equity. From a distribution, it's equity. So equity plus equity is going to make it equity. That's rightly agreed. Wonderful. I guess uh, you would have got your answer. I think what uh, somebody was asking on that, I guess that answers the distribution perspectives. It goes without saying that I think every knowledge is incomplete, you know, without taking a small test. So I think I need to conduct a small test, you know, before we go to some question answer with you. So let's have a look at this and take a decision. A issued CCPS, compulsory, convertible. I think let's put the first question, is it a derivative or a non-derivative? I think it's like asking Basanti, tumara naam kya hai? So in this particular case, it's like a CCPS. That means it's a compulsory convertible preferential. And that's rightly said, what a wonderful audience, non-derivative in nature. 
And that's right, he said. So we would apply a fixed test. He says they are convertible at the end of 10 years where the number of equity share will be determined on the basis of the fair value at the time of conversion. If it is at the time of conversion, that means I am going to issue a variable number of shares. And if that's going to be variable number of shares, in that particular case, it is undoubtedly, that's rightly said, a financial liability. And he says, what if the conversion was fixed at the time of issue? I think you know it well. If you're going to fix it at the time of conversion, at the time of issue itself, then you are going to say fixed number, and that would make it as an equity instrument. That's rightly said. So I think that's a wonderful audience. I think wonderful inputs given by all of you. And I think that also brings me to the end of my discussions with you. I think somebody wanted me to ask, uh, share my mail as well. I think I'll, I'll just share my mail also. Uh, I would be happy to hear inputs from you. So uh, this is my mail and my mobile number as well. Uh, thank you, Vijay, sir. Excellent knowledge session. Thank you so much. I think I'm uh, very heartened. And uh, on the hedge accounting, I, I know it goes without saying that uh, you know, on financial instruments is such a big subject indeed. It is uh, impossible to cover so much in the one hour. But I'm uh, really obliged, uh, CA Sanjay, sir. I think you see this wonderful opportunity for interacting with such a wonderful audience. Thank you, Kapileshwar Balaji. Uh, before uh, we end uh, formally this session, I would request the participant to wait for uh, another five, seven minutes. And uh, I would say that uh, though uh, Kapileshwar sir has given his mobile number, but uh, all the participants uh, are requested to first give him a SMS that he is free. If he is free, then he will reply you. Because you see, reaching to the phone is very easy, and we should utilize the time of the faculty only if he is free. Because right now, as he is giving the lecture or he is giving the deliberation for two and a half hour, it might not be possible. And as such, you should not complain me later on that faculty is not picking up the phone. So always use the SMS for this purpose so that the faculty can be used. Now I would like to say. One uh, word before I give the uh, end of session and uh, Dr. Anil Kumar gave the formal vote of thanks. Sir, there are a lot of council members who are your admirer and I can name few. Uh, they were Sanjeev Meshwari, the ex-council uh, member and the chairman of the Accounting Standard Board. He has a lot of praise for you and also our past president who has inaugurated my this webinar nilesh vikram ji he is also a very good admirer and he always says that you are an asset to the profession so with this uh, i am thankful to you and formal quote of thanks dr anil kumar will say uh, once again a small uh, announcement from voice of ca as i said in the morning that we are going to have specific industry session on 16th August Sunday between 12 to 2 by CA R. Mahesh Ayer, a renowned corporate admirer and SRCC alumni. He will be deliberating on cracking CXO carrot cord carry cord so this is going to be a very very good session please be with us for this relevant registration will also be made applicable on tuesday we will create the event and that will. so far as a lot of people have asked the question about the certificate it needs to be approved by the authorities it will take two three days maximum seven days we will email you a digital certificate of your participation and please have the uh, patience for up to one week and with this uh, i would request uh, dr anil kumar ji to formally give the vote of thanks any question
Yeah, you can also ask the queries from Kartik Jindal. He is also a young and uh, uh, he has also handled the session for last three days. And uh, uh, any any chat box question uh, is there. So formally we will end because I have found that uh, Akhileshwar sir has replied each and every query. Uh, still because uh, looking to the Sunday, uh, any last minute query? No, I think that's not correct. PPT, PPT will be shared on Tuesday and it will be available by evening at voiceofca.in, those who are not subscriber and not member of the CA profession. They can, they can take a takedown from the news of the professional interest in Voice of CA by Tuesday evening. And we will not only post uh, today's PPT, but yesterday and day before yesterday, Shri MPV uh, sir also, we will post all the four PPT in the news for professional interest, which will be released on Tuesday. Since Monday is being a rocky holiday, I am not uh, circulating any, uh, you can say, education material on Monday. Tuesday you will get in your mail ID, as well as those who are not subscriber to Voice of CA, they can get from Voice of CA dot in my website. And also, we will try to put in social media like LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, WhatsApp group wherever it is possible. So, thank you, sir. Thanks once again. And I hand over to the Dr. Anil Kumar. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, a course on accounting standard with experts as speakers and academicians as facilitators was an experiment made by us. That is by Voice of CA, Dean Dial College, and Indian Accounting Association. And from the profile and number of participants in all these three days, more than 800 on the first day, more than 500 on the second day, and more than 450 on the third day. Professors of accounting from all across the country, chartered accountants, mainly practicing chartered accountants, again from different parts of the country, and the CA students. It speaks volumes of success of this program, and the credit for this success, I would say, go entirely to the participants. As Kapil Eshwarji mentioned many times, you have been wonderful participants. Thank you very much. On behalf of all three organizers, that is Voice of CA, on behalf of Dindya Lopadhyay College, on behalf of Indian Accounting Association, I extend to all the participants you attended the program, all the three sessions, you built intelligent creation, and you made the program as a lively program. Our gratitude for the main speaker of today, that is CA Kapileshwar Bhallaji. Uh, Kapileshwar ji, your session was very knowledgeable. Thank you, sir. And delivered by number of illustrations. I particularly like your impressive style teaching, putting the difficult components in a simple language. We really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for giving your valuable time you so to us this morning and that too on a day which is Sunday. And thanks also in absentia to the past president, C.A. Manoj Padnis ji, who could make it today, of course, because of his love and affection for Sanjay Agarwal ji. And despite his important, very important family commitment today morning. Thanks also to Professor Sanjay Bihani, my friend, for chairing the session. He had to leave in between as he has to attend UGC meeting, which was scheduled at 1.30 p.m. today. And thanks to the organizers, voice of CA. Sanjay Agarwal ji, 
put all the efforts to make this program a huge success. So a big thanks to Sanjay Agarwal ji, his team members, and in particular to Avinash Gupta ji. And in fact, as I told you earlier also, that it program. And I was amazed speech with this program was finalized. The program and within one hour, Sanjay ji and Avinash ji was able to speak to all the eminent speakers and the program was given a final shape. The team members of Voice of CA in particular, Rishabh, Karthik, Amar Mittal ji, they put all the efforts in giving technical support and all kind of supports to make this program happen. Thanks also to Deen Dial Upadhyay College, the principal of the college, Dr. Hemchan Jain. He could not be present today. And of course, the Indian Accounting Association, all executive members of Indian Accounting Association and the office bearers of the national body. I do hope that we three, that is voice of CA, in the Alupadhyay College and in an accounting association will be able to come up with another series of the program and the next series which we have planned just now we discussed with Mr. Sanjay Agarwal ji. The program is going to be there on GST. That will be again a certificate course of three or four days duration with eminent speaker and that program would be on GST. Of course that we will announce it in different social media and on the website of Voice of CA also. So thank you very much everyone for coming, for participating. Whatever queries, I think that all the queries have been resolved by the eminent speakers, but if, but if anything is left, we do hope that that will also be cleared off. Thank you very much once again to everyone. I just request to all the participants to please give your feedback. So there is a feedback form. Once you log out from the system, there is a feedback form which will be available on your website, on your desktop. So kindly fill the feedback form and so that uh, if there is any scope of improvement, we will we will try to do it in our next program. And, uh, and uh, two programs have already been announced. One is Rangde Basanti on 15th of August by, one of, by Mr. Madan Pania. He is also an SRCC alumni and a retired IS officer. And 16th, we will have a program for members in industry. Again, by an SRCC alumni, Mr. R. Mahesh Ayer, who have an illustrious 40 years career in the industry and he is an executive coach, especially for people who want to grow themselves into corporate ladders. So please join us in these two important programs that we have on 15th and 16th of August. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.